Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Today we're going to go to the book of Acts again. I preached on Pentecost Sunday, which was last Sunday. I preached on Pentecost, and we're going to preach on it again today. I taught on it Wednesday night as well. And, uh, and so we're going to continue and possibly even a message next week because I'm building a foundation and uh, it won't be completed, I don't think, with today's message. But if you go to Acts chapter, uh, chapter 1, we're going to begin reading there. I hope that those that are watching on video, I hope you've got your Bibles with you. We're going to, uh, on Facebook, if you're watching... We are going to go to several different verses, so you'll, I hope that you can follow along, and uh, if you have your Bibles with you, you can, but we're going to start on Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, so uh, for those that are here, if you're able, if you'll stand as we just reopen up with the Holy Scriptures, if you'll stand, I'd appreciate that, so praise the Lord. We're going to start in verse 4, Acts chapter 1. And being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel. And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put into his own power, or authority is a better word there for you, but you shall receive power. And that's megamite, mega power. In Greek, that's dunamis, but it, uh, it's, it's, it's great power. But you shall receive, verse 8, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto, unto me, both in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now we'll go to chapter 2, and let's, let's, let's look at where they had the experience. This is what we're discussing today. This is the Pentecostal experience. Chapter 2, starting in verse 1. He says, and when, the whole, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven, or divided, tongues, like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now we've got one more verse, two more verses. Chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. The people have heard this and here's their response. It says in verse 12, And they were all amazed and were in doubt, perplexed saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. My message today is on, What meaneth this? What's this all about? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. What, a, what an exciting subject matter, really, for us is today, Lord, to speak about. Holy Spirit, come. I can share your word, Lord. But we need you, Lord, to come and bring it alive to us. We need you, Lord, to give me the words. We need you, Lord, to open up our hearts. We need you, Lord, oh, to bring it alive to us. Come, Holy Spirit. We invite you to come. Come. And we give you the praise. We give you the glory. And may Jesus Christ, our King, our Lord, our Savior, be lifted up to all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. All right, this is really the, you might say, a, really a third message, only the second Sunday, because I spoke on it Wednesday night as well, and I'm building a foundation and sharing maybe some things that most of the time we don't usually hear because everybody focuses on 
the results of Pentecost, you know, that we're to be witnesses, and which I'm going to talk about a little bit today. But, uh, but we, we miss sometimes the foundation. And I feel like the Lord has shown me the, uh, a stronger foundation for our understanding of Pentecost. What does it mean? What does it mean? All right, so let's just uh, review some basic truths and facts we know about Pentecost. We know that it was uh, one of the, the holiday, or one of the festivals, not holidays, one of the festivals that was given to Moses of the feast that they were to celebrate. And this was one of the more important ones. Three, time, three of the, the feasts were celebrated every year, and this is one of them. They were in the promised land when they were given this uh, list of feasts that they were going to celebrate. They, they were not in the promised land. They were in the wilderness, so they hadn't even, weren't able to even celebrate it until they got into the promised land. And we don't usually think of that, but, but uh, they were in the wilderness getting ready to go to Mount Sinai. All right, Pentecost is the same day uh, that they received the law at Mount Sinai. They left through the Red Sea. God delivered them out of Egypt, and 50 days later, they came to Mount Sinai, and they received the law from God. So Pentecost is the same day that we see that we read about here. It's the same day, 50 days. Now here is 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior. 50 days. Penta means 50. It had several names, and one of the most uh, that would relate to us probably as much as any is the Feast of Weeks, seven weeks and then the next day. Seven weeks, 49 days, and then the 50th day would be the next day, which, which was a Sunday. Uh, different times now, as they celebrate it, it's not always on Sunday, but that particular time is believed that it was on a Sunday. And we celebrate, of course, every year, Pentecost Sunday, on a Sunday, so, uh, which is the day that we believe that we've been called, to, at the Lord's Day, the day to worship. Now, what was Pentecost? First of all, it was the beginning of the New Covenant in the church. It was God ordaining the day of the new covenant. The old covenant passed away at Mount Sinai. We see that covenant was given until the day of Pentecost. The church really begins this day, which is the new covenant for us. And what I preached on last week was if we take a look at what uh, was given to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that, that the law that was given at Mount Sinai was a glorious thing. And so I can't repeat that whole sermon, but it's on Facebook. If you want to go to the Jasper Assembly of God Facebook page, you can see the sermons where we put them on there in the Bible studies. But that was a glorious thing, and he speaks about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, when Moses came down from the mountain, we know that his face was covered with a veil because of the glory of it all. He shined from the glory of the law, which kills, which condemns. And he tells us in that chapter, he says, how much greater then is the ministry of grace, the ministry of the new covenant, the ministry that was given at, at the day of Pentecost. And so what I preached on last week for us to recognize is this was a glorious thing. The first glory was a glory that was received in fear. They couldn't take it. They said, Moses, you speak to us. If God speaks to us, we'll die. And it even said they stood afar off and and uh, some even say that it was as far as 12 miles away. But they stood afar off. They couldn't stand it. It was, it was a glorious thing when it was given, but it was given in fear to the Jewish nation. Now, the Pentecost that we're talking about and just read about here today, I just don't believe it was in fear. Oh, there was apprehension, but it was received in a more glorious way. It was received with excitement. It was received with anticipation. Pentecost and the New Covenant was received with excitement. It was more glorious than the glory that, that was given to them at the day of Mount Sinai and, and the day of giving of the law. All right, so we go on from there today. Today I want to answer the question that these people had. There was about 15 languages and nations, you might say, that it appears that were there in Jerusalem they came in from all around to celebrate the feast. And it appears there's about 15 nations. They spoke in many different languages. And we know in, in, the, in the book of Acts, we know that they all heard them speak another tongue, but they all heard, they heard the gospel, they heard the gospel in their own language. All 
15 nations or however many were there, which is very powerful. And so they were speaking in other tongues and they heard it in another language, their own language, and they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a, what a glorious thing. And so some of them, it said, even mocked them that they were drunk and because they couldn't grasp, they were perplexed, and who knows, maybe, maybe they just the speaking in tongues and the, the variety of all that, it just, they thought maybe they were drunk and what's going on here, whatever. And so what we're gonna do is look at it. So what did Peter say? What did Peter tell them? That's the first thing we wanna look at. And so we go to, uh, we just continue on in Acts chapter two. We start in verse 14, so if you've got your Bibles, if you've got your Bibles, I would like you to go to that so you can follow with me. That's Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Here's Peter's answer to their question when they were in awe and amazed and wonder what in the world's going on here. Their question was, what meaneth this? And my people know, because I make comments all the time, but I love the King James. What meaneth this? Isn't that... Isn't that a good way to say it? What's it mean? What's all this going on here? And so verse 14, Acts chapter 2, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice, and he said unto them, You men of Judea, and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known to you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, and of course, with their timetable, it would have been nine o'clock in the morning. Okay, nine o'clock in the morning. And he's saying, look, that doesn't make sense. Why are you saying they're drunk? Obviously, they're not drunk, you know. They're not drinking this early in the morning. All right, verse 16. And then Peter goes on. And he's he's going to answer their question. What does this mean? But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come in the to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day, memorable day, of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're going to stop there. It could continue on. He just keeps talking, gives us a great deal of information. But basically, he tells them of the gospel. And 3,000 people get saved. He shares Jesus with them. And, uh, and 3,000, the first message after Pentecost, 3,000 souls were saved. And in the end, that's what it's about, isn't it? People need the Lord. They need to get right with God. And so that's what it's about. Okay, so let's take a look at this for a second. Just a couple different things I, I would like us to grasp and see in this. First of all, in verse 17, in verse 17, he starts off, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. All right, so the first thing we need to realize, first of all, this is prophetic. If you go back to the book of Joel, and we will go back and look at a verse in Joel, so uh, in, in a few moments we'll go back and look at just one verse. But, uh, but if you go back to Joel, you're talking about 800, maybe even 900 years before Jesus came. That's what we call prophetic, looking ahead, foreseeing ahead. The prophets of old were given this information by God, and they spoke as the Spirit moved them, we talked about that in Sunday school today, as the Spirit moved them, they didn't make this up and it came to pass, it came true, something that was said eight or nine hundred years before. Again, more confirmation to us as Christians in a way, confirmation that the Word of God is true, isn't it? 
And so uh, eight and 900 years earlier, he spoke this. It says in the last days. And so we as Christians understand the day of Pentecost as the beginning of the last days. I truly believe he's talking about the last days being the day of the church age. The day from the, and I also believe to add this to your study of book Revelation, I believe it's from the first trumpet to the last trumpet when Christ shall come and we should be raised and raptured out of here at the last trump. All right, so, um, so we have here the last days. Notice it's plural. Notice that it wasn't just that one day. There are so many uh, non-Pentecostal Christians that claim that it was just the days of the apostle or the day here that was spoken of. But we know as Christians, because we've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, we know that it wasn't just then. It's even available to all people now. And so he says the last days. And let's follow what he says here. He says, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. All right, now in our human understanding, our first thought might be that every individual in the world in the history of time, right, uh, that he's going to pour his spirit out upon them, but that's not really what it's saying. What it's really saying is there's a diversity of nations and tongues and different types of people. There's young, old, handmaiden servants. There's Asian. There's, there's European, right? There's Australian. There's American. And so he's saying all flesh. He'll pour out his spirit to all those that receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In fact, that's really referred to in the message. If we would have kept reading the gospel that, that, uh, that Peter spoke, that we didn't, we didn't read it far enough for that. But he actually said, he says, to all them that believe shall receive salvation and the gift of the Holy Spirit. To those that receive. So he wasn't meaning, when he said all flesh, he wasn't meaning that every individual walk in the earth. He meant all those that believe, no matter what age, no matter what gender, no matter what nationality. Okay? And so that helps us to understand what he's talking about here. And he goes on, he says... And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Okay, prophecy. Prophecy is first thought of because of Old Testament prophets would foretell. And that is first for a, a definition, really. If you go to the, the Strong's Concordance and look it up, the first word, he'll say foretelling or foreseeing the future. But in the New Testament sense, it also means much more. It means to speak by inspiration of God. It means to speak and testify of Jesus Christ. For the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of Jesus, we're told, in the book of Revelation. And so in the New Testament, what we have is prophets, but we have, we still, I, I still believe there's the prophet, the office of the prophet, although we don't, uh, there's so many of them out there, it's hard to distinguish which ones are and which are not. But I do believe there still is the the prophet speaking and can foretell something, but I also believe God's made this available uh, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit and so on. He's made this really available to us all. We can all prophesy, and even at times, he might speak through you an event or a circumstance in somebody's life, possibly, okay? Because we have all, when we receive Christ, we all, that's what it's saying here, all, sons and daughters, handmaidens and servants, we all, if you'll notice here, he mentions that in the next part too, will prophesy. So that's really, if you want to think of it this way, it's divine or inspirational speaking. And especially, especially the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ so people can hear the gospel and be saved. All right, so we see this. He says, your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. I want to tell you, I've had both. I haven't had a lot. Most of the time, I, my dreams, most of the time I wake up and I don't remember them or I remember them for a few minutes or it wasn't really a godly dream in a way. It was possibly I ate too much pizza, you know. So that, I'd have to tell you that about my dreams. But, but I have had some visions and I had one in particular that I'll just share with you. I had a, 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 a good friend whose sister was, was dying. She hadn't eaten for a month. And, uh, and I had a vision when I was in my car. Uh, first of all, he took me and another friend, and we went and prayed for her, okay? And then 
Um, it was the next day, I guess. I was out in my car and uh, driving around Atlanta, and I had a vision. I saw her eating, and she hadn't eaten for over a month. The doctor said that she was going, pretty much probably going to die. She was going downhill fast. She didn't even have enough strength to walk down the stairs from her bedroom. And so we went and prayed for her, and I had that vision. And I shared it, uh, I called my wife up and shared it with her and in case, uh, you know, so that, that uh, my friend, could, it could confirm to him that this really happened, you know. And so, in a way, he ended up calling me and I told him to call my wife and confirm that, that I had had this vision. Because here's what happened. He called me up to tell me that day that she'd eaten a full meal the next day. I had a vision I believe was from God. God still gives visions. I heard a, a famous if I told you his name, I, it's sad. I heard a, a famous preacher on the radio was in my car one day, this many years ago, well known, you know his name. And he made the statement that God still doesn't speak through visions and dreams. And I, my heart just dropped. I mean, I know better. You know better. Because of the day of Pentecost, he still speaks. We know that through visions and dreams. And that's what it says here. Okay, let's move on. He says in verse 18, And on my servants... And on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days, notice again, those days of, this, of my spirit, and they shall again, what's the word? Prophesy. All right, so he ends up stopping here with that part of the message. I'll make a comment about the other next part, just a brief comment. But, but he's telling us here that he's confirming to us by the way this is worded, that Pentecost was not just for the apostles, first of all, and, and I hate to even have to say that, but it's been taught so strongly in our, in fact, at least in the church age that I've lived in here in the South, it's taught strongly that, that, that God doesn't do this today and so on. And, and so he makes it very clear. It doesn't matter about your title. Are you a manager of some big corporation or are you just a servant? It doesn't matter if you're a woman. It doesn't matter if you're a man. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. He pours out his spirit on all that will believe and that will receive of his spirit, that will ask and receive of the spirit. And so to all those, notice it was sons and daughters all. And that's the important message, I guess, for us to get out of this today. All right, so let's just take a, I, wanna, I do want to make a comment about 19 and 20. We won't go deep into it, but it says in verse 19, he says, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable or memorable day of the Lord come. Okay, just my two cents, guys, because I know there's all kind of views on this stuff. My two cents. I believe this was the work of the cross. I believe it's the time when the, the sun was darkened while Jesus was on the cross. I believe they, they, had, they did have earthquake. There was all kinds of signs and wonders that happened at that time. Now let me, let me point out something to you for you that would first say, well, it can't be that. But I want you to look at verse 20. He says, all these signs will happen and see the word before. Remember, Joel is speaking 800 to 900 years before Jesus came. And so I just want to throw that out there. That's my feelings on it. Again, my two cents on that, those two verses. I believe it's the work of the cross. Before he comes and before, you know, that memorable day comes when he comes, is, is, uh, these signs will happen. So we'll just move on from there. All right, so, so we see where... The things that we've talked about, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because that's what he called it. He said, John baptized with water, but Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that's exactly what happens when you get saved. Fire just wells up within you. You just, Jesus is everything. God is everything. He's, for the rest of your life, you'll never be the same after you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not downplaying salvation. You'll never be the same if you've truly been changed by the Spirit of God and you're born again a new creature in Christ. But the fire comes from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so I speak that to those that have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
I tell you, if you ask, you receive. If you really desire and you're hungry for God, he says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So hunger for God. Seek the word. Cry out to him. Pray and say, oh God, I want to be filled. I want more. That's all he asks for. You want more righteousness. You want more of God. And I, there's no doubt in my mind, that's the righteous prayer. And he will answer that. It may be instantly. It may be a week from now. It may be a month from now. But, uh, but you will receive. And that's... Uh, for you that uh, have, have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And again, I'll say to those that are Pentecostals, many of us have received and we're sitting back doing nothing. You need a refilling, so to speak. And so that's also what I believe. I believe he refills. He restirs. You stir your heart and call out and say, God, I need to be removed, restirred, refilled. And I believe he'll take care of that as well in a similar fashion. All right, so, so that's what uh, Peter said. That's what Peter said. It was for all of us. And it was for power. Jesus says it was for the power that we would receive to be witnesses. Now, as I was preparing for this, I saw a couple of things that I've not seen before. One thing is I recognized in this text, I just realized this last night, really, I was, as I was going to bed, I was thinking about my text, and, and I realized, you know, Joel never once mentioned that we would be witnesses. I had to think about that a moment. That thought came to my mind. I, I have to believe it's the Lord. I've not thought this about this. We just we always preach on we're going to be witnesses is primarily the, the Pentecostal message for everybody. We're going to be witnesses. We got power and then you, you deal with the, the gifts of the Spirit and the speaking in tongues and so on. But I want to tell you that uh, that it's more than that. And last week I set a little bit of foundation. I want to set some more for you today. Yes, first of all and foremost, it is about us becoming witnesses that people will see in us something we have and they desire it because they truly want God. First and foremost, we are given that power that we might be witnesses and it says unto Jesus and actually if you look at the definition of that word unto, the uh, Strong's will just say simpler form to Jesus. So you and I are supposed to be witnesses to Jesus. That's number one for Pentecost. All right, but let us set a greater word for you today that I feel like the Lord has shown me. I want you to, to recognize or believe that Pentecost is, I say I want you to believe, this is what I believe. Pentecost is God's answer to the cross. I want to give you a moment to, to run that through your brain. Pentecost is God's answer to the cross. Pentecost is God's answer to judgment. You know, I was thinking about this as I, I'm going to show you what I feel like the Lord showed me, but, but I was thinking about this and I thought, you know, we, we have a way of, okay, Jesus has been crucified He's died, buried. He's rose again and he's ascended up in heaven. But other than recognizing that at the ascension he told him to go and wait, we've almost separated, theologically you might say, the work of the cross with Pentecost. And I want to show you that it's so much more than, than just we will receive power. Okay? I believe that it's the answer to judgment. Now let us go to Joel, and I'm going to show you one verse. Go to verse 25. See, this is God's answer. Joel is showing us as a shadow, you might say. He's showing us the purpose of what he's prophesying about in Joel. And so let us read verse 25. If you've got your Bible, I hope you got there. Joel chapter 2, verse 25. Now I want you to recognize that three verses later is where Joel speaks, and he says, And it shall come to pass afterwards, in verse 28, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And we just read that, didn't we? Verse 28 is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that Peter connects with, that he gives us an answer of what this means, what Joel was meaning. All right, let us look at verse 25. 
He says, and I will restore unto you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my, my great army. So God sent the army of these pests, which I sent among you. I will restore you. Okay, I believe that this is a shadow. Israel, they were being plagued by disease, drought, their waters were drying up, their cattle and their livestock was dying. The caterpillar, the canker worm, I'd forgotten that one, and the palmer worm, the locusts, they were destroying all their resources for food. In fact, it says in the book of, uh, in the book of Joel, it mentions they were even eating the bark off the trees. They were devastated. Israel was, was dying with no food, their livestock, drought. It was terrible. It was the judgment of Almighty God. You saw at the end of that verse where I read that. He says, uh, he says I'll restore you of my great army which I sent among you. God had sent judgment. He had sent judgment. And what was his response to judgment? Verse 25. Let's read it again. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. The canker worm, caterpillar, palmer worm, the great army I've sent against you. So he had sent judgment. He had sent a devastating wrath against them. A judgment against their sin. A judgment because they've been disobedient. A judgment against Israel to where everything was terrible and they needed to cry out to God. And what's his response? To judgment, his response was mercy. His response was grace. His response was, I will restore you. And what does he say? How will he restore them? And it will come to pass, verse 28, afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons, your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Also upon the servants and the handmaids in those days I will pour out of my spirit. I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood, fire. You recognize it. Exactly what he quoted, almost word for word, what was quoted in, in the book of Acts. He quoted almost exactly word for word what Joel had said, which was the restoration from their judgment. And I'm trying to connect to you today, and only the Lord can open it up as I see this and as I saw it. But Pentecost is the response. It is God's answer to his judgment. The cross was judgment on all sin to all mankind. It was the final judgment. Jesus took the wrath of God. It was the judgment of God. And God's answer in response to that was, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. It was mercy. It was mercy. There's a a verse in Psalm 85, which I had to look up, but it says in that verse, it says that righteousness and peace have kissed each other. At the cross, the one righteous, the one that was righteous and took our sin on the cross, exchanged his righteousness with our sin and gave us righteousness of God. And when he did that, when we received Jesus Christ, let me read that again to you. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. With God's wrath, his arms are open to give us his mercy, his peace, his joy. He wants to give us power to restore. So what, what does this mean? What, what does that mean? I think maybe something that we don't talk about much with witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ is that restoration means restoration of our soul. It means restoration to becoming that that God wants us to be. It means a restoration that, that will, will restore us from the things that the, the canker worm, the palmer worm, the locusts have eaten in our lives in the past. We get saved and we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and he begins restoring. It's called what we call 
sanctification as he sanctifies us more and more as we mature in the Lord, as we become more and more like Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. He's restoring our soul, giving us what the devil has stolen from us, giving it back to us, giving us life where we were walking in death, giving us hope where we had nothing but fear, giving us something to look forward to where in the past all you had forward look forward to was making a lot of money or whatever your goal was and dying one day. He's restoring our souls. Well, what happens with the restoration of your soul? It gives you power. It gives you power of His Spirit to testify about the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that Pentecost was God's response of His wrath. The wrath of God was the cross. It was the judgment of Almighty God. His response to that for me and you and for the whole world, it was the final wrath. The shadow was given to us there in Joel. He gives that to us now at Pentecost to restore that, that, the, that, the, that everything's been eaten away in the past. The devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy our lives, and he's done, he's done a good job about it in the past. Now he's given us a power at Pentecost where you and I, as we are baptized in the Holy Ghost, we now know, we know that we know that there's a power living in us that's greater than that that's in the world. We know the greater is he that's in us. We know that there's a power there and his word tells us that we are overcomers and we can overcome. We know there's a life in him and in him is life. And we know as we start growing in the Lord, if you've been walking with the Lord for many years, you recognize, you can look past at your earlier Christianity and you see that even if you weren't super active, that God continues to work with you and to grow you and to make you more like Jesus. This gives you the power to be witnesses. Now, we as Pentecostals, we understand that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are real. We understand that God might give you a word of knowledge. He might give you a word of wisdom. James says, if anybody asks for wisdom, let him ask. I mean, how, how, how can it be hard to believe he can give you a, a word of wisdom when James even talks about it? We believe that you can be healed. I've had many healings. In fact, for you that know, I, I do a YouTube site. I do a devotion every week, and, and I give a, the link to that on my devotion. Um, you can go to my YouTube site. I've got about 13 videos on healing because I've had several, and three or four or five of those major healings that I've had. And I share with you what I learned and what, I, what, what, what happened. One or two were instant. Most of them were progressive, and I tell you how God dealt with me during that time. God still heals. Now, why am I sharing that? Because as we get baptized in the Holy Ghost, we recognize God still heals. He still delivers. The gifts of the Spirit are real. He's done a great work in our life, and we have all kinds of stories about when God answered prayer in our lives. And then we can go and we can share. We can be witnesses unto Jesus about all these different things. You know, we usually think, oh, you got to go share Jesus with your mouth. And that's true. They, they, they need to hear to be saved. Chances are they've already heard. But you can share your testimony of what he's done when he gave you a word of wisdom, when he healed your body at some time, or when he answered a prayer for a loved one that you prayed for. You can share those things with him too. You can be a witness unto Jesus about the time you were trying to do something, you needed to know something, and God gave you a word of knowledge. And you go, oh, okay. And you recognize God helped you. And you can testify. You can be a witness unto Jesus to Jesus in so many varied ways than just, as we say, preaching at him. You know what I'm saying? And so I just want you to understand that Pentecost is connected to the cross. God poured out his wrath on sin, on judgment. It was the judgment of God. And his response and his answer to that is open up your arms, repent and turn to Jesus Christ call out upon him and he will answer and he will have mercy on you. He will restore that that the locust and the canker worm and the devil is who we're talking about here has taken in your life in the past. He will restore you. He will give you power to be witnesses unto Jesus. Spiritually, mentally, physically, you shall receive power. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this word. Oh, Holy Spirit, come now.
come. Father, there's people watching me on, on the video. Lord, may not be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Oh God, I pray that you'll, if they're hungry for you, Lord, that you'll touch them, that you'll deal with them, that you'll reveal to them that there's a second experience after salvation called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Lord, they've been taught differently, probably. But Lord, show them that your word is what we go by. And that you'll pour out your spirit upon all flesh in the last days of the church age. That you've done it to millions around the world and you're still doing it to people day by day. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Speak to those that need to be filled with your spirit, Lord. That they'll call out to you, Lord, that you can fill them with the spirit of God. And Lord, for those Pentecostals, as I said before, they're just sitting at the pews and, and they never share the Lord. They've never prayed with anybody. They've never shared Jesus with anybody. Lord, move upon them. Are they truly baptized in the Holy Spirit? They need to be refilled. Those that are Pentecostals that claim they're Pentecostals and they like to talk about it and they look for all the wonders of it all. They want all the gifts of the Spirit and they want the goosebumps and all that, but they never share Jesus. Something's wrong. Speak to our hearts, Lord, each and every one of us, Lord. We need you. Come, revive us, restore us, move us, stir us from our place that we're at, Lord. Oh, Lord God, we give you the praise. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. For you at our church, the, the pew's open. Just come to the front pew if you want prayer for something special. Just come to the front and we'll pray with you.